forth. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, to the Japan Zoominar. My guest today is Dr. Scott Wilbur from the United States Trade Representative, and we'll talk about the current state of US-Japan trade relations. Some of our audience are still taking their seats, so let me take just a few moments to explain to you who we are and why we're here. Um, this is the Japan Zoominar. I'm Ulrike Schede. I work at this wonderful university. Uh, at UCSD, we are at GPS, the School of Global Policy and Strategy, and uh, we have some impressive numbers here. The most important information might be that we have a eight degrees, including a Master of International Affairs with a Japan specialization. If you're interested in what we do at GPS, please visit gps.ucsd.edu. And at GPS, we have JFIT, which is our Japan Forum for Innovation and Technology. We do a bunch of interesting things. You can um, uh, look us up at jfit.ucsd.edu. Our events are recorded, as our regulars know very well. So um, uh, today, if you have any questions for our speaker, feel free to type in any questions you might have into the Q&A box. I will then, uh, if I read them out, refer to you only by your first name uh, to protect your privacy. And uh, because our events are recorded, that means you can see past events in our Jay-Z gallery, which you can find at jfit.ucsd.edu slash Zoominar. And of course, this is a recurring event. Every two weeks, we meet on Tuesday afternoons, 4 to 5 p.m. California time. Today, we have Scott Wilbur, who I'll introduce in just a moment. Uh, in two weeks from now, we'll have Mireya Solis from the Brookings Institution talk about her new book titled Japan's Quiet Leadership, Reshaping the Indo-Pacific, followed by Mariko Togashi. And that'll be actually a direct follow on to what we're gonna talk about today. Mariko is a research fellow for Japanese security and defense policy at IISS and an expert on global supply chains and uh, business interests. Uh, in them. And then as we get closer to Christmas, we'll have Jasmine Abel talk about the Shinkansen and the history of the Shinkansen. So that'll be a little bit uh, less industrial policy and more lighthearted. I hope you'll enjoy it. Okay. And with that, let me stop here and introduce our speaker. Here he is, Scott Wilbur. Hello. Hello to uh, Washington, D.C. Good evening. Yes. Uh, good afternoon to folks in California. Good morning to friends uh, in Hong Kong and Japan and around the world. Thank you so much for having me today. So let me introduce you uh, a little bit. I mean, lots of people know who you are, but uh, but not, not everybody. So Scott Wilbur is a Japan, Asia, and government and economics specialist. He's fluent in Chinese, Japanese, and some French. So I think, Scott, I want to go to Paris with you sometime. Um, he, he earned his BS in at Georgetown Foreign Service. He holds an MA from National Taiwan University, which is where his Chinese came from, and a PhD from the University of Southern California in political science and international relations. He then did a postdoc at Yale, and uh, since then has held several positions in government, including as a presidential management fellow at the Treasury uh, Fiscal Service and USTR. He's worked in uh, US Customs and Border Protection and is the fresh and newly incoming, I think for now four months or so, Director for Japan Affairs at the USTR. And uh, I would be a miss Scott if I didn't mention that you've also written about the Japanese economy. I was looking for papers to assign from reading for my Japanese business class and I was looking for a zombie paper and your paper popped up titled Unfinished Business, SME Zombies, which is a 2019 paper. And it's about the efficiency about Jap among Japanese firms. So Scott knows the Japanese economy very well, and he knows Asia very well. And it's just great that we have you in government now, and it's great to have you here. So thank you for joining me. Thank you, Ulrike. So, so I think let's start a little bit with, um, you know, um, you, you described the event today as let's look at the USDR. Let's take a fresh look what the USDR does, what it is, and then uh, discuss a little bit how policies have changed uh, and um, what, what the contemporary trade issues are between Japan and the United States. So why, why don't you give us a quick rundown about what you think or what your perception is of your job right now? Sure. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to introduce the agency where I work, the United States Trade Representative, or more, more formally, the Office of the United States Trade Representative, which um, compared to Treasury, compared to State, um, is not one of the founding 
departments or agencies in the United States government actually has a pretty recent history. Um, in fact, up until about the 60s, the Department of State uh, was the main uh, agency responsible for U.S. trade diplomacy. And USTR only came about uh, sort of more recently within the last 50 or 60 years or so. So USTR um, was, was christened as such uh, in the 1970s. Um, prior to that, again, state was sort of the main operator for trade diplomacy. Um, and eventually, um, Congress wanted a little bit more balance between um, international and domestic interests. Uh, it created a special trade representative. Um, and then in the 70s, that special trade representative was given enhanced authority um, to be the lead on various trade agreement programs and also on negotiating trade agreements. Um, and in the 70s, again, um, it was given power to um, actually, I should say, be represented at the, the cabinet level um, and uh, given, again, the lead for developing and coordinating policy um, and trade negotiations. So the, uh, the head of the United States Trade Representative um, is a cabinet member um, today. That is Catherine Tai. Um, and USTR, um, beneath Ambassador Tai, is sort of structured in three separate um, operational ways. Uh, one is in functional offices, second is in regional offices, and the third is in legal counsel. Um, so functional offices, you might imagine they have coverage for respective sectors like agriculture, textiles, intellectual property, and such. Um, they're really the subject matter experts. Um, then there are the regional offices. Um, I'm part of a regional office. My regional office encompasses Japan, Korea, and APEC. Um, regional offices, they coordinate um, and communicate with USTR's counterparts um, in different governments uh, and entities like the WTO to address trade issues. And then that last sort of operational area is the legal team, um, the, operative, like the office of our general counsel, and they provide advice on trade agreement law, um, and they work on enforcement of trade rules negotiated at the WTO and also in bilateral trade agreements. Um, I want to stress one more thing. Um, even though people think USTR uh, mainly does international trade negotiations, actually the bulk of our negotiations are internal uh, inside the U.S. government. So I think we do, again, as, at least as much negotiation domestically as internationally. Um, the way that that happens uh, is through two particular mechanisms. Um, one is the Trade Policy Staff Committee, and the second is the Trade Policy Review Group. Um, these groups, they're chaired by USTR. They're composed of many federal agencies, almost 20, um, and, and they're the main mechanism for developing and coordinating U.S. positions on international trade. Um, and so the, the Trade Policy Staff Committee, um, that's filled with mainly senior civil servants, that's the main mechanism. Um, and then if agreement is not reached within the, the TPSC, then those kind of issues go to the Trade Policy Review Group. And that's usually sort of the undersecretary or the deputy USTR. Those are really the sort of top people beneath the, uh, the agency heads. Um, and then, of course, we also work a lot with Congress. Um, so the main sort of bodies in Congress we work with are the House Committee on Ways and Means, also the Senate Finance Committee. Um, but we also provide briefings for other committees, uh, congressional leadership offices, caucuses, and then individual members of Congress. So, oh, so sorry, those of us, uh, yeah, yeah, no, that's great. That's great. Super interesting. Um, those of us who've been uh, around long enough to remember the Japan US, US Japan trade war, the Bueki Masatsu uh, of the late 80s and early 90s, remember the USDR as the main player in the negotiations. Right. I mean, those were the were those like the high days of the USTR. Is, is that no longer the case, or are we not doing trade negotiations like that anymore? Well, we're we're certainly looking at trade in a different way. Um, so I I think that was if not the the peak of of sort of frictions and maybe um, USTR's profile in sort of regard as being this tough you know negotiator pushing for for breakthroughs in market access in Japan and elsewhere. Um, you know, of course, more recently, we, there's there have been other negotiations, certainly um, in the 21st century, too. But you know, I, I do recall kind of using Rising Sun, Michael Crichton, when I was teaching um, to show sort of the prominence of, of you know, U.S.-Japan trade frictions. Um, these days, there's a very different orientation uh, to trade uh, under the current administration. And I think it's really important to, to highlight it. And I would say even it's the main takeaway from tonight's talk. Um, you know, we can talk about many things, but I, I would kind of leave people with 
the strong impression is that trade isn't what it, what it sort of was um, when we're talking about the sort of the frictions and really pushing hard for market access. So today, um, the sort of the main name of the game is the worker-centered trade agenda. And again, that's sort of the key takeaway I, w- I would impress upon folks. So that's been the main priority for the Biden administration. Um, what it means, it means a few things. It means inclusivity and transparency and outreach and consultation. It means bringing in people who haven't necessarily been included in the conversation before or hadn't benefited from previous approaches. Um, and then it also means that, that trade itself is, is really needing to be sort of thought of as a way to protect people on the planet and not just an end of itself. Um, this has been seen over the past couple of years um, in the Indo-Pacific, also with Taiwan and Kenya. Um, and it also means respecting workers, not just in the United States, uh, but beyond our borders too. Um, so a, sort of a prominent example of this was the rapid response labor mechanism in the United States, Mexico, Canada, free trade agreement. Um, and, and what that mechanism is meant is to identify uh, where workers are being denied rights to organize and collectively bargain. Um, and so because of this rapid response labor ne- mechanism, we're actually seeing real change and success for workers and in independent unions in Mexico now. Um, we're, you know, we're achieving new bargaining agreements, salary increases, uh, safer working conditions. And, and this respect for workers, you know, with, again, this example of Mexico, but elsewhere too, the idea that it raises, it raises regional labor standards um, and sort of it pushes the race um, to the top in trade. So that's super interesting. I'm wondering whether the reason for the shift is this this new global enterprise. I seem to recall a paper by Sam Parmesano at IBM saying, well, we just happen to, we, we're a global company that happens to be headquartered in the United States, but fundamentally our people work everywhere. And, and that's true for our more and more companies, right? So, so it's no longer really that clear what whether whether what, what what trade actually is if we're talking about companies with huge foreign direct investments all around the globe. Yeah, well, I, I think it's also too driven by the perception that maybe trade is, is a little bit more fragile than it used to be, and the coalition that sort of underpinned trade um, has more questions about its benefits. Um, you know, certainly, in, in Rust Belt states, uh, some of which can be key electoral states. Um, but I think more generally, there's just been a rethinking of trade, um, you know, with, with different factors. So kind of the rise of, of you know, huge exporting economies that maybe have affected traditional domestic producers here. Also, you know, sort of disruptions due to COVID. Um, and again, really sort of focusing on people who haven't benefited or really been included in the discussion around trade before. So that, that's truly the main focus of this administration. Um, and it's something to highlight. So let me let me push you a little bit, though. I mean, there is there is still trade, and there's something called economic coercion, which is a whole new thing. I, well, maybe not. Maybe that's as old as uh, as mankind. But but in any event, so some of the contemporary trade issues around the Indo-Pacific economic framework and 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 the, the economic coercion. Can you talk a little bit about the USDR's position on those matters? Sure, absolutely. So I'll, I'll start with economic coercion, and then I'll get into IPEF. And I think these are both tied to economic security. Um, from the lineup that you previewed at the start of the talk, it seems like there's going to be some very well-informed, articulate folks to come in after me. So hopefully this will just sort of whet people's appetite for more uh, later this fall. But on economic coercion, um, it's definitely a major concern for uh, the industrial democracies right now. Um, I think a kind of working definition might be non-market, non-market economies, um, uh, which use coercive measures to punish other countries and economies for sovereign actions. You know, an instance of that was in summer of 2021. Lithuania took the sovereign action of opening the Taiwanese representative office, um, and the way that China responded was by making it difficult for Lithuanian exporters to do business in China. Um, so. Right now, USTR, we're working with Japan um, in bilateral and multilateral fora to discuss uh, and address economic coercion. Um, A good example of that is how uh, we've worked with Japan and other like-minded partners and allies, uh, specifically the Five Eyes countries, Australia, Canada, New Zealand, and the UK. 
uh, to this past summer um, in June, we issued a joint declaration against trade-related economic coercion and non-market policies and practices. And it's really a clear message from us that we share concerns about economic coercion um, as well as these non-market policies and practices um, and that we're facing them head on. So um, our our audience is tough. I'm I'm getting uh, I'm getting little hints that we should talk about U.S. Japan because this is a Japan seminar. And uh, so 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 we come back to the economic coercion and the and the and the collaboration because it's a, just a whole big thing and the decoupling and all of that. But let's let's zoom in on Japan for a moment here. So what is the current state of affairs of of the bilateral trade relationship between Japan and the United States. I've, I've heard people say it's no longer important because Japan is no longer a big trading partner and you know, all kinds of stuff. So, so uh, give us a give us a lay of the land there. Okay. Well, that, that first of all, it, it can't be that it's not important because the numbers don't lie. Uh, Japan is <clears throat> our, our fourth uh, largest trade partner after Canada, Mexico, and China. So it's a big top country. Um, we do not have a comprehensive trade agreement with free trade agreement, excuse me, with Japan, uh, but we have had uh, breakthroughs recently in the past few years. So there's a few of these agreements that I'd like to highlight. Um, one of which was a bilateral trade agreement um, for market access on certain agriculture and industrial goods, which we concluded in late 2019, and that went into effect in early 2020. Um, there was also a digital free trade agreement, digital trade agreement, excuse me. Um, and then this year, we also signed a trade agreement on critical minerals, uh, establishing commitments for cooperation on critical mineral supply chains. And then shortly after that agreement went into force, uh, Treasury designated Japan as a country uh, with which the United States has an FDA for the purposes of the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, and that designation allowed electric vehicles containing certain percentages of critical mineral components processed in Japan to qualify for tax credits uh, under the IRA. There's been, there's been lots of activity uh, in these past few years. Um, and, you know, I, again, it's a huge economy. So trade is, is still a very active uh, work stream here in USTR with Japan. Well, we could also argue, I mean, this, so, so because of the US-Japan trade war of the old days that some of us do recall vividly, and the vitriol that came with it, and the the voluntary export restraints, and the local content rules, and NAFTA, and the big sucking sound, and all of those. That was a different day of trade, I think, maybe. But um, the end, the net result was that the Japanese companies, of course, created a lot of production facilities here, and now make more cars in the United States than American car makers, and employ more people in the automobile industry than American automobile makers. So, so that's, th th those are, you know, things that change the trade relationship, I guess, but also the country relationship. Um, uh, but, but let me, let me ask you another question on the trade thing, though, which may be not a USDR question, but I'm sure you, you've been around the various offices in, in DC, uh, you know, to, to know. So there's this thing called FIRMA, which is, um, a, a an act that allows a foreign investment uh something it allows the US government to say no you 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 may not buy this company or no you may not like buy this real estate property or something and um it's been around for a long long time and gotten you know re-empowered I guess uh under the Trump administration uh when there were some concerns about cybersecurity and data and whatnot and and japan is a, not one of the countries that is sort of exempted from from a review and and i think that that bothers some people in japan can can you explain a little bit more about why the u.s would take such a harsh stance on japan there if that's what sure. it is Yes, but I need to call the up my response with saying that um, this question is really a Treasury and specifically a CFIUS question, uh, not so much a USTR question. So I'll, I'll kind of answer it with what I know based mainly on you know public source knowledge that's out there. Um, that list of, of countries that qualify for an exemption um, from, from the screening is very, very narrow and very small. I think it includes Canada, uh, Australia, United, United Kingdom, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and to have that exemption, I believe countries that are applying for it um, or are interested in getting it um, need a very rigorous 
sort of investment screening mechanisms and themselves. Uh, and until recently, I'm not sure Japan had the legislation um, to, to be able to say that it actually had that kind of screening uh, you know, capability. I believe it has something that it does, you know, screen for investment. I, I don't know how CPS folks are, are treating it or understanding it. I also know that that conversation is ongoing in CPS. Um, so it may be a matter of time and things may, may shift, but um, I, I can't, you know, sort of speculate with any more detail about why Japan doesn't have uh, that designation. I, I think that's right. So I think in either 21 or 22, Japan uh, established its own thing there. So so I think that I, I think you're right on this direction. So may, maybe that's that's going to get get reviewed. It, it I, I don't even know to what extent that is a real thing. Right. And, you know, if a Japanese company wants to buy something, how difficult is it to get through that screening, I you know we, we we don't know what the what the reality is of that situation. But there's there's still I mean the larger point here is that there's still some bones of contention between the two countries and as it comes to trade, right? There's still are we still talking agriculture? Sometimes, um, <laughs> you know, I, I want to say that there's a lot of cooperation. I mean, Japan is is an incredibly good partner for us. Um, there's there's lots of cooperation going on in the G7, you know, also bilaterally through a relatively recent mechanism called the United States and Japan a Partnership on Trade, and then something that's also very new, which is the Labor Task Force. Um, but when you're speaking about kind of irritants or maybe even um, you know things that have been around for a while that are, are bones to pick, the best place to look for information on that is our National Trade Estimate. Um, it's a big report that the USTR publishes every March, I believe. Um, and so actually we're probably gearing up right around now to, to kick that off. Um, and yes, there, there are some things that are still of concern to the United States about Japan's uh, treatment of, of imports. Agriculture is one of them in certain you know, specific sectors. So there are price markups on rice, on wheat, um, you know, autos, again, they're very traditional, uh, but still extant irritant. Um, so there are non-tariff barriers to uh, access to Japan's automotive market. Um, they don't accept U.S. federal motor vehicle safety standards. Um, there's lack of opportunities for input by interested persons during the, the process of developing regulations in Japan. Um, and then there's also hindrances to the development of distribution and service networks. So uh, 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 David has a, a question that takes me back to the old days. And in fact, actually, a journalist asked me this uh, recently uh, about, about the uh, finance which has, which in the eighties was like the biggest thing, right? Financial regulate deregulation in Japan and the exchange rate and the interest rates and so forth and so on. And today the, you know, the, the, does the USDR have any position on, on what the, on the BOJ's yield curve control or, you know, or is that still a thing or is that just yesteryear? You know, I, I don't think we, we have a position, um, and I don't think we would speculate what, what Japan should be doing or shouldn't be doing. Um, you know, if, if, if there's any agency that, that would be considering that, it's, it's most likely Treasury. Um, and, and they don't care. I, I, so so yeah. why do you think if you speculate, I mean, you've been around the block for a long time too, right? So why, what, what's your speculation as a, you know, sort of, what, how, what has changed? Why is this no longer something that the U.S.? would tell Japan what to do? You know, I, I think there are other areas of, of cooperation um, that are really taking precedence. So, you know, I think, you know, one being China, um, another being economic security. So this is something you referred to earlier. Um, you know, this, this issue of economic coercion. So, U.S. And, and, and Japan have very tight cooperation um, on the G7 along with other G7 countries. Um, so they launched uh, a, a coordination platform on economic coercion, um, and that's meant to increase like, collective assessment, preparedness, deterrence, uh, and then response to economic coercion. Um, also, we're, sort of, we're focused on um, other areas, too, uh, like WTO reform, export controls, business and human rights. And so, you know, some of these, these may be more direct bilateral issues. Um, they're being eclipsed, or at least they're being sort of complemented by 
other concerns that have emerged in the past few decades. So the audience is putting in questions and there, there are two people named Chris that are asking a very constructive and forward-looking questions. So let me let me put both of read both of these Chris's out to you. So the, the the first the first one is that there are a lot of great Japanese technologies that are somehow not coming out of Japan when the companies might be not able to scale or commercialize or something. And so is there anything we can do, we, we meaning the United States or, or you, uh, can do to incentivize tech transfer and R&D investments from Japan into the United States? And, and a similar version of that, the, the other Chris asked uh, that, 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 Close ally, allies such as Japan and the United States would both benefit from more corporate alliances, especially in areas such as semiconductors and biotech. Well, let's go to the semiconductors later. But, 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 what do you think about such collaboration and and you know shifting the whole USDR lens toward let's do something together and be strong together? Yeah, that, that's a tough question to ask from my my shoes. Um, because um, you know we're sort of focused on on breaking down trade barriers. Uh, that that's at least been the traditional sort of modus operandi for USTR, um, and and sort of we leave it up to you know individual companies, the private sector, to decide to invest or not. Um, so you know if if there's a specific sort of barrier that that's happening, that's something that we would kind of key in on. But um, we're, our sort of our mission isn't really to promote, you know, investment in a particular country, um, even if it is an ally. So I, I, it's kind of a hard question to answer. So I like this question, though, right? Because it kind of uh, it, it, it's it's as the what it's the what if question. What if we were to change our views and just our point of view to say, well, let's create something rather than you know, control or coerce or stop, you know, so what can the two of us do together? There's also, I mean, that brings me to another issue, which is the whole thing about data and cybersecurity and the the tech, the, you know, the, the, the new technology developments. Is the USDR at all involved in those things? Um, you know, most recently, I would, I would mention again, the digital trade agreement uh, between the United States and Japan. Um, that set sort of high-level commitments for preventing uh, barriers to, to cross-border data flows, um, you, know, you know, forced transfer of source code, um, data localization, um, problems like that. Um, but since that agreement um, on the cyber stuff, I haven't heard as much. Hmm. Well, it might be other parts of government. I don't know, but so, so that's uh, um, you know I hear that a lot. If if there are two countries in the world that should actually get together and and see whether we can regulate AI and data better, it might it might be Japan and and the U.S. Right? That should, because the EU does their own thing, and some of it is good, and some of it is very restrictive, and then China does its own thing, which is different. Yeah. And, and somehow there's this vacuum to fill in the middle that the U.S. is somehow not getting it. I guess. Maybe there's a different way of, of thinking about it, not so much not getting it, but just that um, there hasn't been sort of a clear cohesion or coalescence around a particular policy position on AI. Um, so I, I think the administration is being open-minded and trying to listen to various stakeholders on it um, because there are kind of various concerns and pros and cons to it. And they're not trying to sort of shut out the debate um, before it's really crystallized around sort of certain key nodes. Um, so, I mean, I definitely think Japan has, has been discussing AI too. You know, you mentioned other countries. So it, it's not sort of particular to the United States um, that, you know, around AI, there's not a lot of a kind of coherence yet, um, uh, but there is certainly lots of talk. So the audience uh, is pushing us to talk about three industries in particular. Uh, and I don't know whether, you know, you do whatever you can do. Or, you know, there might be some things where you just have to, you know, kind of uh, uh, decline, but that's okay. Uh, so the first is about um, energy, environment, and so forth. Um, uh, the EU, what's your view of the EU's carbon border adjustment mechanism? You know, sort of so some sort of carbon thing that I actually don't understand. I'm just reading out the question. Uh, is that something that you have a view on? 
would the US consider a carbon border adjustment mechanism? That that's not in my read. So I that's not your read. Okay. Uh, I'll like, you know, Mark, maybe you can rephrase that question so we understand what's it. But but related to uh energy or carbon, can you talk more about the uh USDR Japan EV and mineral agreement? Is there one? I don't know. That uh, Tracy yeah. may have to give us a little bit more information as well. There are so many agreements. I don't I, I thought it was about EVs that electric vehicles, I guess. But maybe not. Sure. Um so I, uh, I think that the person is referring to the treasury designation of um, Japan as a country that the United States has an, an FTA with, um, again, related to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Um, and so yeah, it, it would it, uh, sort of backing up a little bit, uh, we talked about the worker centered trade policy being kind of the key initiative, the key trade policy priority for the Biden administration. Um, and that sort of dovetails with larger efforts underway by the administration um, in terms of its sort of main economic policy. There have been a lot of big, um, like large scale in investments in America under this administration. So one of which is the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, of course, there's also the CHIPS Act um, and then there's an infrastructure law. Um, so the Inf Inflation Reduction Act, you know, despite its name, um, is largely aimed at addressing climate issues, um, and you know EVs being one potential way for people to you know, take up a new product um, and thereby reduce their carbon footprint. Um, it was key to the Biden administration, and so it wanted to incentivize people to to buy EVs, um, but also make sure that. The components inside them are responsibly sourced, um, you know, not sourced from countries that use forced labor, for example. Um, and so the United States had to reach agreement with Japan related to how it processes certain EV components um, to make sure that those commitments are met. Um, but then it allows the EVs with those components from Japan to you know, be sold in the United States. And that didn't qualify for the tax benefit. So I, uh, I of course, mostly read the business news and what companies are doing, and uh, I see that the huge interest in Japan to respond to the incentives of the IRA coming to the United States and producing um, things here for you know with all the with all the goodies and tax breaks uh, involved. So so this I, I could I could see how this actually would bring the two countries uh, more together in terms of pulling some of those. Um, providers of, of input materials uh, to the US. So the other two uh, industries that I'm getting a lot of questions on is the first is services. Uh, is USDR involved in market access in Japan for businesses such as Uber, Lyft, Airbnb, and some of these other, uh, I don't even know what to call them, gig, gig things or you know uh, the, new, the new service industry? This is actually a, probably an old question. Is, is there still uh, industry level trade negotiations between the, Japan and the United States like that? Well, I, you know, I, I have to admit something that I'm, I'm sad about, but it's the truth. I haven't been to Japan since 2019 before the pandemic. Um, so, and my recollection was um, those kinds of the gig economy, um, taxi services weren't, weren't widely exited in Japan um, at that time. And, and, I don't know that whether that was due to a specific trade barrier. So I, I haven't heard um, you know, that there is such a trade barrier. So I, I, I can't respond saying that we're actively trying to address it. Yeah, I think it's one of those. I mean, so first of all, I've Airbnb in Japan. So Airbnb is there. Uh, and then and then the, the Japanese pushback was that apartment buildings didn't want these tourists, right? And so they crank down on Airbnb, but that had nothing to do with uh, a trade level, I think. On the Uber side, it's a little bit more complicated, but there are now Ubers, uh, right? So, but but again, it's Japan. So it might not actually be in your bailiwick, but that doesn't mean that there are no non-tariff trade barriers to some of these things. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah, let's, let's, um, uh, let, let, let's talk semiconductors, so, because there's a, a big pent up demand here for, for this. So, so, um, uh, maybe we'll start from the general. So the U.S., the recent U.S. activities on reshoring semiconductor production and so forth, right? It's a new type of industrial policy in the United States. 
I don't know whether that's within the USDR or somewhere else, but it, it's there, right? Um, and then Japan seems to be copying this. So, so what are we doing with semicons? What, what's, what's the U.S. trade policy regarding semiconductors, and 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 why do we think we need to help companies like Intel be globally competitive? So, I, I, this is also not specifically a USTR um, sort of area of responsibility. This is much more Department of Commerce. Uh, the Chips Act is being stood up under Secretary Raimondo. Um, and so USTR doesn't have much involvement there. Um, you know, I, I think, um, you know, with Intel, you know, for example, there was perception that over time um, it had lost market share and that where chips were being produced um, were in areas of, of vulnerability. Um, and so from that economic security perspective, there was a desire to bring it back uh, onshore um, to ensure that, you know, we have these vital components for, basically every kind of industrial, or not industrial, but yes, industrial, you know, electronic um, good. Um, and that's sort of powering the 21st century. So um, and that was sort of the main impetus behind the CHIPS Act. Um, but again, as far as USTR involvement, um, it's, it's really not there. It's really led by commerce. Yeah, so this is interesting, right? So the questions actually reflect that that we have a very nebulous understanding of what the USDR does, <laughs> because we're asking you these questions about uh, trade policy, but in terms of a different type of policy that we're thinking. Here's a pro question from Peter um, that actually I think does fall into the USDR area. What is your response when people in the Japanese government or Keidan-ren ask you to help get the US back into TPP? We hear that question often, um, and the administration currently has no interest in doing trade agreements um, related to tariff reduction, elimination, and, and pushing for market access in the conventional way. Um, so there, there's no momentum now for joining the TPP, um, and I don't foresee it. Um, I think that, that uh, Ambassador Tai said to a group of, of Japanese uh, women political leaders uh, and business leaders um, when they visited uh, last month um, was to stress sort of the fragility again of the coalition that that underpins trade at the moment and there's just no no appetite for the TPP right now oh, that was interesting and and what does that uh, well, uh, maybe that's also not a question for you, but <laughs> that, that, there, there are some implications for this, right? And, and in, in terms of also what you do, right? Because if the U.S. is not part of the CPTPP, um, does that make your life harder, therefore? But shouldn't it changes what you do, I guess? No, you know, again, we, we welcome when Japan, if they say that to us, um, you know, we prefer that we can address it underneath one of the mechanisms I mentioned before, the United States-Japan Partnership on Trade. Um, but again, there's just no um, push from the, the administration um, for these kinds of agreements. So, um, you know, we're welcome, we're, we welcome constructive ideas, but there's, there's just not the, the appetite to match right now. Yeah, so that's interesting. We get some comments, right? So wouldn't that be an easy way to foster unity vis-a-vis -vis China and so forth and so on? But that's a maybe I'll have to invite another speaker for, for this particular question. So so then David wonders, okay, fine, that's good. Uh, but then how do you, how does the USDR formulate and prioritize policy initiatives? So so what, you know, there's so much going on in the world, right? What criteria are used to decide? what the priorities and the important policies are. Yeah. So, it, you know, in response to that, th this is where I would bring up the IPES, because it's not as if we're not doing something in the region. Um, it's just that we're doing something different. Um, and the IPES for Indo-Pacific Economic Framework is something that was launched pretty recently, uh, last year in Tokyo, in fact. Um, and it's different from this conventional trade agreement that would be anchored on tariff production. Um, there are four pillars. Um, three of the pillars, supply chain, clean energy, and tax, and anti-corruption, those are all led by commerce, where USTR comes in as the fourth pillar on trade. Um, and so there, we're trying to build high standard, inclusive, free and fair trade commitments on, um, you know, different areas, ranging from labor, environment, digital economy, 
trade facilitation, agriculture, um, et cetera. And, you know, work in these different areas ties to three goals um, that relate to economic security. So one, resilience. Um, so we're trying to achieve strong trade facilitation provisions, uh, good regulatory practices, uh, and commitments on competition policy. We're also aiming for inclusion of the goal. Um, and again, that gets back to labor. So having high, high standard commitments on labor rights and digital economy. And then thirdly, sustainability. Um, and so IPEF is, is the main sort of activity going on right now as far as our negotiating work. Um, and it's something that we're hoping to have um, you know, more announcements about you know, in the near future. So, um, so, so there's the IPEF, uh, the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework, is really the U.S. version of FOIP, right? Which is the Free and Open Indo-Pacific, and uh, there, there seems to be this uh, idea that the United States came up with the with the concept, but it was actually the Suga administration in 2021 that that coined the FOIP. But it doesn't matter who started it, right? But the, both Japan and the United States are suddenly interested in this. How are the U.S. and Japan connected over this FOIP program? What what are the what are the connectors? Why, why are both suddenly so excited about the Indo-Pacific? Yeah, I, I think because it's such a source of economic growth now and looking into the future. Um, and of course, it's not just about China and Northeast Asia. It's about Southeast Asia as well. It's about India. Um, so the IPEF includes these new partners um, that haven't been part of sort of the kind of conventional Asia-Pacific or East Asia um, picture. Um, it, it's hard to describe what because I think it's a larger concept. Um, you know, IPEF is specifically related to these different, more or less economic areas. Um, um, whereas FOIP, I think, also maybe includes a, a security dimension. Um, you know, related to the free travel of of the oceans. Um, so I, I I can't kind of layer them over on top of each other. Um, but I, I definitely think that you know the IPEF is the main the main sort of focus of energy for um, a trade engagement and, and, you know, other kinds of economic engagement in that region right now. And, and um, um, uh, are you cooperating with Japan on, on forging those frame, uh, that framework or what, how does that look like? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I mean, I think the United States and Japan are working very closely on IPEF. They've been a great negotiating partner for the United States. Um, and they're helpful with, you know, understanding kind of concerns of other countries that have, have joined in the IPEF um, that maybe haven't been sort of the traditional actors um, in these broader trade, trade engagements. So um, Japan has been very helpful to the United States. So, so we get we get some interest in okay. So, can we are using trade strategically always, right? Uh, and um, so, here's an example question, and we want to maybe if we could open this up to some sort of the broader point. The example question is: Is there any active talk about Japan, Japan diversifying fertilizer imports to reduce its reliance on China and source more from the United States? And, and so, the, and the larger the larger question would be, uh, what are what are the, the sort of the polit political strategies underlying some of these trade uh, conversations? Yeah, this this is sorry, and I, I appreciate the question immensely, but it, it's not one where we're well positioned to answer, just because um, you know we're concerned about potential barriers to U.S. exporters to Japan not necessarily what Japan as an industry is doing unless it affects U.S. exporters. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, I could speculate, but that would just be kind of foreshadowing um, what, I, what I would assume, but I don't know for a fact. Um, so I, I sort of had difficulty saying much about diversification other than that. I think there's just in general lots of diversification going on, you know, due to concern about vulnerability and kind of lack of resilience if there's a breakdown in sort of single focus on a given supplier. So yeah, so this whole decoupling, right? That changes the the that that the changes the outlook a little bit. I mean it used to be trade used to be one country talking to another country and uh you know or several other countries. And now we're talking 
a whole web of interrelated things that are somehow in balance. And if you pull out one element, then the whole balance might fall or something. So how does that affect how you kind of think about, so we're talking to Japan. So Japan has a lot of bilateral trade agreements now, right? Uh, maybe securing its FDI and other countries. And it also has all of these multilateral things going on, whether that's FOIP or CPTPP and so forth and so on. Um, does the U.S. do something similar? I mean, are we are we sort of pursuing all of these bilateral things, and in, in, in addition to some of the larger things we're not doing, or what, what's what's the core strategy uh, going forward? Yeah, I, I definitely think that there's you know diversification might not be the exact, the most precise word uh, to use, um, but you know, I'm talking about making supply chains safer um, and more secure. Um, that's something that the United States is actually working on. Um, it, again, this isn't the USTR's area. This is more led by commerce and in, in the IPEF. Um, but certainly, yeah, there's lots of discussion about supply chains going on in IPEF, you know, in the G7, um, with Japan bilaterally. So um, I think it's, it's a recurrent theme, and I, I'm sure that it's happening with other bilateral partners of the United States, too. So then, uh, you know, so we, we, you know, the, there's always the negative. We're trying the positive thing. Let me try the negative. What needs to be improved in uh, the bilateral trade relationship between the U.S. and Japan? Uh, well, I mean, there's always the list of of NTE era tense. Um, so that 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 there's always things to work on there. Um, it's it's a very good relationship. So you know, even though there's certainly pockets of, of you know issues and problems or, or difficulties that we need to address, um, I do want to stress how positive it is overall. You know, and the fact that we're we're very comfortable talking with each other about different things, um, you know, in an open way. It, it, it's again, on the whole, a, a fantastic relationship. Um, you know, I. I just think we need to to keep having regular discussions. Frankly, um, that's not that's not saying that we haven't had regular discussions. It just means that we need to maintain the momentum that we've had. Um, so you know, I mean, again, looking forward to these these ongoing talks we have with the United States Japan Partnership on Trade, um, which was a mechanism that we've we sort of institutionalized um, these bilateral discussions. Again, not not just about domestic things or, or bilateral things, but you know, where we can cooperate in, in multilateral fora, um, you know, addressing this, this forced labor issue, environmental related questions, and digital ecosystem. Um, so that's been a very way, positive way of cooperating with Japan. We need to do more of that. Um, this new uh, mechanism I mentioned, the labor task force. So that's something that's just gotten off the ground this year. Um, we're hopeful to have um, the first of its meetings pretty soon. Um, you know, this is a new way we're going to cooperate. So again, I think just maintaining the momentum um, in the relationship right now is, is the way to improve it. So Japan's interests are very different though from the United States, right? So Japan still has a huge manufacturing base and the, you know, the news over the weekend that Toyota is like this close to applying the Toyota production system to making uh, car batteries, right? And that will change. Um, you know that so that that changes Japan's outlook of what's important and and a lot of those things are made in Japan. So exports still very important for Japan at at, at various levels. In the United States, a very different economy now, where you know we bemoan, or in some circles at least, we think we we're losing our competitiveness and so forth. So, to what extent can these two countries that have such a different profile actually collaborate on things like? Uh, you know, work, work together on on, on trade matters. I mean, could there be a, a synergy synergy effects and on third places or or where the, 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 the two I think are pretty much disaligned, right? Misaligned. No, I mean I, I think we're both advanced uh, industrial democracies. We both have interests in free and fair markets. Um, I think in principles we're we're actually fairly aligned. Um, so and again, I consider Japan to be one of our strongest partners, and we have a very strong trade relationship. Um, you know, Japan is a big market for us. We're obviously a big market for Japan. Um, we we care about that fact. Um, 
you know, I, 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 I sort of struggle to think, you know, about other things because I, I mentioned before the, you know, the worker centered uh, trade agenda. I, I think that's also an area where we're starting to cooperate more again, related issues like uh, forced labor. Um, so, you know, I, I think there's much more cooperation going on than, you know, stress or antagonism or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, uh, you know, if we were talking China, we would have probably a much more, uh, um, you know, heated heated discussion. Uh, we we're talking Japan, you know, as a sort of, we've become, you know, brother aligned forces or brothers or whatever, or sisters or whatever that is. So so um, the, the, the regular audience knows that I like to close uh, always with a question that um, Professor Hugh Patrick from Columbia, my my mentor in the old days um, taught me to ask in interviews, and that is in in this area of your your current assignment. Uh, what worries you most? What are what are some of the things that could go wrong? And and then maybe you know what do you do about that not happening? But let's start with what worries you most. Mm. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult answer, question to answer, sort of impromptu, um, but, you know, I, I think there's a lot of question now about where trade sits um, in terms of priorities for the administration. Um, there's lots of questions about, you know, the fact, for example, that IPEF is this new form of, of trade engagement, um, but it's not going to be binding. Um, you know, there's lots of discussion about, um, and this is out in the media, you know, certain people not having as much power as they, they, they did in, in the previous roles or in previous administrations vis-a-vis -vis other departments. Um, you know, I think USDR is doing what it's supposed to be doing, and it's doing what the Biden administration wants to be doing, is looking at this worker-centered worker -centered trade agenda um, in a very serious way and trying to improve, you know, people's lives, you know, people who haven't had advantageous positions, who have been overlooked, um, who haven't benefited before, um, and you know, I think not understanding that and not understanding where the U.S. is at domestically and politically, um, it, it it risks um, you know missed opportunities to work together because the United States still wants to do things on trade. It may not be able to do certain things that it once did before. Um, and that maybe you know seen you know honestly in the balance is as not being the right thing you know to have done what we had done or 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 something but you know again try to understand the biggest risk I think would be um, not seeing this as kind of a paradigm shift um, in where the United States is with trade thinking about trade um, and then missing you know opportunities to collaborate. Do you think the U.S. does a good enough job on explaining what? the workers and trade agenda means specifically? There, I, I hear a lot of commentary that say whatever that means or what is that or why is that? So we have a, we have a few minutes. So if you wanted to take this moment to actually explain it to us and uh, from the USDR perspective, I think it would be very interesting. Mm, you know, and that's also, this is difficult to answer to say, you know, qualitatively, it's, it's not as good as it could be or as weaker than it could be or it's not promoted as, as loudly as it needs to be. Um, I, I just think this is something that's going to take time maybe to, to percolate and to really set in. Um, but, you know, I'm, I'm saying this more as an understanding for people that have who aren't necessarily working in this, in this sphere because, you know, here on the job day to day, um, we hear it all the time. Um, you know, it's in our talking points. Um, it's on our web pages. You know, about the agency. If anyone wants to look at USTR, um, and I believe it's in the media. But you know, I'm just I'm just trying to impress upon people um, in the audience that this is really an important sort of shift, a tectonic shift in trade. Um, and when we we think about you know the TPP or kind of what was up through the 2010s and oh you know things are going to go back to that. So that's interesting, right? So, so the worker centered, I think that means it's it's more almost more like an ESG focus on trade or a an SDG focus on trade, right? So it's about the people, it's about the integrity of the supply chains, the integrity of labor relations, the integrity of uh, the countries that we deal with. 
-hmm. some ethics right. to come in maybe. Um, and so trade is maybe not so much, I mean, in this view, if I understand it correctly, it's not so much putting pushing dollars across borders, but rather making sure that the people that we deal with are treated in the right way or that the, the, the things that we, that we purchase about, are made in the right way. Not about efficiency maximization, right? But about yeah, right. Okay. So that's very interesting because that then has, uh, that affects everything you do because then you don't need these big voluminous um, agreements across countries anymore. You can actually put it on one page uh, that, you know, if the people are treated right, we, we deal with you. And if not, then we don't, that sort of thing. I don't think anything the government does is ever on just one page. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the worry is that we don't get this right, and then we lose out on a particular moment in time. And then, you know, I think that's a that's a really a big concern that that we should all uh, you know be concerned about, we're worried about, and 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 maybe help the government uh, implement. So thank you, Scott, for taking uh, time to explain this to us. I I don't envy you for your job. I think you have a very very difficult job, and uh, we, we hope that you that you'll be very successful uh, in this position. And audience, thank you for uh, joining us and for uh, getting over the various log on uh, barriers. Uh, we'll try to make that easier going forward still. And um, in two weeks from now, we have Maria Solis from the Brookings Institution talking about the political scientist's view of these trade agreements, right? So she's an observer of uh, things that the Japan uh, wants to do and, and wants to get done with the United States. So it's basically the, the opposite angle, I guess, or the same angle. I don't know. So thank you, Scott Wilbur. It was great to have you here. Thank you, audience, for joining us. And we'll see you in two weeks. Until then. Stay safe.